Naman, the Syrian commander's leprosy, was healed following the dipping in the Jordan for seven times. Whereas Elisa refused Naman's gifts, his servant Gehazi coveted for them and was punished with leprosy for his greed. We shall also see Elisa miraculously made an ex hat float on another occasion. A very warm welcome to you, dear friends. To know God is to love Him. And one way to love Him is to love His Word. And we are glad to have you in our Bible study today. We looked at Naaman, a Syrian army captain in our preceding lesson. Though pagan, he was described as a great and honorable man, but was suffering from leprosy. Prompted by his maid's proposal, he left for Israel expecting a dramatic healing by Elisa. After an initial disappointment on Elisa's instruction to dip seven times in the Jordan, his subsequent obedience resulted in a complete healing. Naaman responded in three ways. First, he acknowledged the God of Israel as a true God. Second, he offered gifts of gold, silver, and clothes. Third, he took two mule lots of dirt from Israel. While Elisa, God's prophet, refused the gifts, Gehazi, his servant, secretly coveted and received them, resulting in being punished with leprosy. We learned lessons on God's overarching will and power and godly response to pride and greed. With that, let us get straight into our study for today. Notice this amazing declaration of his faith. Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Please accept now a gift from your servant. The prophet answered in verse 16, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry. For your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. Verse 18 but may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimen to bow down and he is leaning on my arm and I bow there also. When I bow down in the temple of Rimen, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, Elisha said after Naaman had traveled some distance. Notice what happens. Naaman is deeply grateful for his healing. Naaman is pressing Elisha to accept these rich gifts. You notice, he has brought them as a token of his appreciation. But Elisha will not accept payment for what God has done. Now Elisha had a servant named Gehazi. He hated to see that handsome reward slip by, so he took out after Naaman. Verse 21, So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? He asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, Two young men, from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing, a blatant lie. Verse 23, By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them. 
urged, notice the word, and then tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing. He gave them to two of his servants and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. Why did Gehazi take the offering from Naaman? The answer is simple, listener. It was greed. Verse 24 When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in his house. He sent the men away and they left. And he went in and stood before his master, Elisha. Where have you been? Elisha asked. Your servant didn't go anywhere. Gehazi answered. Verses 24 and 25 of Second Kings chapter 5. Notice with me, friends, Gehazi allowed the servants to carry the gifts as far as the tower. Then he took them himself and sent the servants back to Naaman, so that Elisha would not see Naaman's servants. With the gifts safely stored away, Gehazi rushes back to his job, acting as if nothing happened. Now notice verses 26 and 27, very revealing verses. But Elisha said to him, was not my spirit with you, Gehazi, when the man got down from his chariot to meet you, referring to Naaman? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes, olive groves, vineyards, flocks, herds, men servants, maid servants? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha, from Elisha's presence, and he was leprous, as white as snow. Just two observations, friends. The great sin of Naaman was, remember we discussed it, was pride. And the great sin of Gehazi was greed. My dear friend, greed also is a leprosy of the soul. Now we come to chapter 6, another amazing phase and an experience in Elisha's life. We will see in this chapter two more thrilling experiences that Elisha had. Elisha was an outstanding prophet, although he was a different prophet from Elijah, his mentor. Elijah's public work and service was seen by all. Elisha's service was more private. We have just seen how he dealt with Naaman, the captain of the Syrian army, of the Syrian host. Elijah was spectacular. He brought down fire and rain from heaven. Elisha was not like that. He was a quiet man. He shunned the spotlight. However, both these prophets were equally God's men at God's time. Our attention will center now on Elisha. I do not think that any miracle so reveals the character of a person and a prophet as the miracle of the floating axe head, as we shall see now. Verse 1 of chapter 6 of Second Kings. The company of the prophet said to Elisha, Look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us. Now this reveals something of the popularity of this prophet Elisha. He taught in the school of prophets. The school grew and they needed larger quarters. This was due to the presence and the popularity of Elisha. The strength, I feel, and the value of any school friends is the character and the ability of those who teach. Note the second sentence that I'm about to say. It's vital. Listen intently. It is not the methods, but the men that are important. 
men look for methods god looks for men now notice what they did in order to enlarge the school they said was to let us go to the jordan where each of us can get a pole and let us build a place for us to live there and elisha said go the students of the school of prophets built their own school that would be an unusual thing in our day won't it today everything has to be given to students in order to get them through school and if it doesn't suit them they don't cooperate but these students you notice they went out even to work even to build a place and elisha encourages them in their pursuit verse 3 then one of them said won't you please come with your servants elisha again replies i will this is a refreshing and thrilling verse isn't it it is an insight into the winsome character of this prophet elisha it reveals that he was very popular with his students by the way do students ordinarily take their teachers with them beyond the boundary of their campus many cases friends the students would like to leave the teachers in school but these students they ask elisha to come with them wherever they go it speaks so much about the work and the influence of elisha in the lives of his students the school of prophets was for and he went with them they went to the jordan and began to cut down trees now a small tragedy takes place i say small because the ordinary person would call this a trivial incident as one of them was cutting down a tree the iron axe head fell into the water oh my lord he cried out it was borrowed there is something here that is quite interesting it reveals that god is concerned about the small events in each of our lives our small things are big things in the eyes of a big god you remember that paul said to the philippian christians pray without ceasing pray about everything ask god for everything and he did not mean to leave anything out the loss of an accent may seem insignificant to us but this poor student for him it is not so small the fact of the matter is is that it was quite a big event in his life in our days of gadgets when we can go down to any hardware store and get an axe head of about 15 different shapes and sizes this does not seem important but in that day friends in that context we must understand it was of tremendous importance because any kind of iron tool or weapon was very scarce the young man knew right where it was but he could not get it out because he could not see it the water was not clear now notice what takes place in the next verse the man of god that is elisha asked was 6 where did it fall when he showed him the place elisha cut a stick and threw it there and what happens wonder of wonders miracle miracle and made the iron float can iron float this was indeed a miracle and i do not think that you can explain it away this is one miracle not sensational not spectacular as going to heaven in a chariot of fire that is great this miracle is great in its simplicity it is a miracle when iron floats it is a miracle 
It is contrary to all the laws of physics. My friend, it was a miracle for an axe head on the bottom of the river Jordan to float on top like a cock. I know it is not startling, not sensational, but it's simple. This is typical of Elisha's methods. Elijah would have never done it this way. In fact, I don't think Elijah would have been bothered with a thing as small as this. An axe head, dormant, on the bottom of the muddy Jordan, is raised, you could also use the word resurrected, if you please, and then restored to the owner, replaced on the handle, and it becomes useful again, utilitarian and functional. That's really a greater miracle than these others because there's a tremendous spiritual message here for each of us today. Man, friends, today is like that axe head. He has slipped off the handle. He has fallen. He has become totally, totally depraved. So Elisha cut down a stick, you notice. He cast it into the waters of death. That stick, friends, is the cross of Christ. Our Lord came down to that cross and he went down into the waters of death to save you and me. Let me quote a verse from 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. It says, Who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree. That stick in Elisha's case. That we being dead to sins should live to righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. Verse 7, you notice, Elisha says, lift it out. Then the man reached out his hand and took it. All you have to do is that you have to reach out your hand, your hand of faith today. He died for you. He rose again for you in order that he may lift you up. All you have to do from your position is to reach out your hand of faith. Reach out and touch him. Come to the cross. Remember the cross that crossed our sins away. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. You are that axe head and the stick floats. Just lift up your arm of faith and trust him and he will give you life. God bless you. We thank God for the great lessons again, brothers and sisters. Few of them that we can recall and take to our hearts are, firstly, the warning that grit is another leprosy of the soul and we need to flee from its entanglement. This is with a clear understanding that greed can blind us. It can block us from doing good as well as make us ignorant on evil. It can lead us to cheat, steal, manipulate, destroy or kill. Secondly, our focus was on stewardship. Every child of God needs to live in the realization that everything we have is God's and we are finally accountable to Him and that the care we sow with the providence placed in our hands reflect our gratitude on the giver. Finally, we are reminded again that nothing is impossible for God. The universe, dear friends, moves and has its being according to His will and for His glory alone, as praise and honor are due to Him always.